Well, good evening and welcome to the latest edition of The Definite Article, where each week we discuss a recent article written by an IA author. I'm Sai Kamal, the IA's Academic and Research Director, and standing in tonight for our media manager, Emily Carver. And tonight I'm delighted to be joined by my colleagues, Julian Jessup, uh, one of our IA Economics Fellows, and Professor Len Shackleton, the Editorial and Research Fellow. Now tonight we're going to deviate slightly from our usual format, and rather than discussing just one article, we'll be looking at two. Uh, Julian and Len have a new report out today in conjunction with between the IA and Civitas called Rebooting Britain, How the UK Economy Can Recover from Coronavirus. And what they've done, or based on that, that uh, publication, they've written a, a few articles in City AM and CapEx, respectively. Um, and so we're going to be discussing those with both Len and Julian. But before we do so, uh, to help us keep providing free content during these tough times, please could you consider making a contribution, no matter how modest, by donating online at ia.org.uk, where you can also sign up for our daily newsletter, IA Daily. So now on with the show. Now, when the crisis started, lockdown appeared the appropriate response to avoid overwhelming the NHS. Now, we're in week 13, attitudes seem to be shifting to the economic risks of lockdown, with forecasts suggesting that there could be as many as 6.5 million job losses. Now, our new briefing paper from the IA and Civitas released today concludes that while the initial decline in activity may prove to be smaller than some fear, it will still be huge, and lifting a lockdown may not be sufficient in itself to allow a robust and speedy recovery. The paper is released in time for a possible budget in July, and increasing pressure on the government to provide a roadmap, roadmap for recovery. And it makes the important point that while some argue that this pandemic has demonstrated the need for a permanent increase in government intervention and public spending, the evidence doesn't really uh, support this view. The crisis has uh, highlighted the flexibility of private businesses and civil society and illustrated some weaknesses in state planning. Well, what I'll do is leave that to Julian and Len to fill the viewers in. Uh, Julian and Len, thank you very much for joining us tonight. I wonder if I can come to you first, Julian. You've written oh. the City AM about the press and need for government to intervene less, mm. not more. Why don't you talk us through your piece and explain why some suggest that this crisis calls for a bigger state and why you think such a conclusion is wrong? Okay, well, as a starting point, I think the, the government has done what it had to do. Um, I think the state clearly had to, to step in. There was a, an unprecedented public health crisis, uh, and it was necessary to um, shut down large parts of the market economy in order to, to save lives. And given that the, the government was shutting down large parts of the economy, I think it made sense for the state to step in and, and protect businesses and jobs and, and basic incomes during that period. So the, the initial response of the government, I think, has been absolutely right, uh, and I'm reasonably relaxed about the, the case for doing so. Um, however, the, the dynamics are now changing. Um, we are starting to, to lift the, the lockdown, so that huge constraint on the, the economy is starting to, starting to clear. Uh, and it's right, I think, that that should, should continue. Um, as long as the, the health numbers continue to improve in the way that they have, um, then I think the worst of the health crisis has been averted. Uh, and we need to shift the focus a bit more to the, the broader context. Um, as it happens, even in terms of the, the health situation, that there's increasing evidence that the lockdown might be doing more harm than good. So you might think, for example, about um, patients with non-COVID-related illnesses who are not getting the treatment that they need, whether that's cancer patients or even people with heart attacks. So uh, even in terms of the, the health effects, there are big things to be concerned about. But um, there's a sort of broader context as well. So you know, the fact that schools are being shut down is, is clearly bad news for the education of, of, of young people. Uh, the prospect of a prolonged period of high unemployment is, is damaging, you know, not just in economic terms, but also in terms of the health and well-being of people who are, who are stuck on the dole. So I think the dynamics are, are shifting. Uh, and during this period, I think the government should be thinking about actually doing less rather than more. I mean, obviously, there's a big temptation to continue with these massive government spending programmes and maybe even to spend more in a mini budget. But I think actually the opposite is appropriate. You know, the government has, has shut down the economy. Now it needs to get out of the way and let the sort of market economy reboot itself. Uh, and I think the track record of the British economy in particular has been pretty good here. You know, it's a pretty flexible economy. I think, you know, the recovery could surprise on the upside, provided the government moves aside. Uh, Len, you've also written today, you wrote, you wrote for CapEx, in, in the same way that Julian talked about rebooting, uh, and rebooting markets, you talk about the need for markets to be permitted to repurpose employment. And you suggest that we draw inspiration from Ludwig Erhardt, who was uh, advised by Volta Eucken, after West, uh, in the West German 
uh, government after the Second World War. Uh, do you want to elaborate on that a bit? That's a forgotten episode, I think. Um, at the end of the Second World War, Germany, uh, Western Germany, which is the part which the uh, the Allies, uh, the um, Americans, and uh, the French, and, and, and the British occupied, uh, that was under their control. Um, what Erhard did, and Oikam did, was was to persuade the the, the, the uh, controllers of the economy to, to liberalise. And you have to have to remember that the, the, the German economy is in a far worse state than, than we are going to be as a consequence of this. Food consumption was about half pre-war levels. Uh, you had uh, industrial production was only about a third of what it had been in 1938. And um, there was a huge chunk of sort of the prime age workforce was either dead or in prison of war camps or otherwise dispersed. So the German economy was in a terrible, terrible state. Um, but Erhard and the, the, his, his colleagues had the confidence to let the market rip, scrap price controls and other, other controls on, on business, and let the, let the market rip. And I, I think you know, this is the model for what we should be doing post-COVID-19. Post, uh, we have to let the market, you see, the market's done very well during this. It, it, you know, if we look, if we compare the public sector with the private sector during this, this lockdown period, it's the private sector which wins hands down, I think, in terms of the food supplies being maintained. We can get virtually any good we want on delivery within 24 hours or so. Uh, and you look at the public sector, and what have we got? We've got the tube system in a complete mess. We've got the NHS with huge, huge waiting lists and, 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 and you know, everything has been subordinated to one target only. Uh, we've got schools which are now talking about not even coming back in in, uh, in September. So the record of the public sector is not great. Well, we don't want more of that. We want to see more liberalisation. We want to see the market uh, allowed to do its thing. Now, Glenn talks there about the recovery after World War II in West Germany. Julian, the government has locked down the economy. Uh, we've seen tax revenues dry up at a time mm -hmm. when the state is spending billions more on health, wage subsidies, small business grants and universal credit. How can we pay for this additional spending? And why have you concluded that we shouldn't bear austerity 2.0? Yeah, I, 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 can't, I can't believe I'm saying this, given how awful the, the public finance number is going to look like. I mean, the you know, borrowing this year will probably be, you know, as much as 15 percent of, of, of GDP. Uh, the debt level will be well over two trillion pounds at the bottom of GDP. That'll be well over 100 percent of, of GDP. These are absolutely horrible numbers, but um, I still think there are some, some reasons for not panicking. Uh, one, of course, is that we have seen much higher levels of both borrowing and, and debt in the past, particularly during the, the last two world wars, and that arguably is a more appropriate benchmark today. Um, but the, the second point is that this should only be a sort of one-off increase in annual borrowing and a, and a step increase in the debt. This, this shouldn't be the start of a deteriorating trend. As long as the, the economy is allowed to recover, then borrowing will drop back sharply next year because you know, tax revenues will go up again, welfare spending will fall, uh, a lot of the fiscal measures can be, can be reversed. Um, and also debt to GDP um, will start falling because GDP is, is recovering. Uh, in the meantime, um, of course, interest rates are, for now at least, very low. So the, the cost of servicing that additional debt is, is not very high. Um, so in the short term, I don't think there is anything to, to worry about, not too much anyway. Um, but I would be concerned in, in, in the longer term for if this continued for, for a number of reasons. Um, and for a start, interest rates aren't going to remain this low forever. I mean, you know, at some point, the economy is going to recover, inflation may well pick up. So the Bank of England can't keep interest rates near zero for, for, for ever and a day. Um, but also, if we do get more borrowing on top of what we're already doing, so if we do get, you know, these, these promises met for huge fiscal stimulus and a permanent increase in the size of the state, then the patience of the markets isn't going to last forever. Uh, and even if there weren't a problem financing it, of course, we must remember that, you know, any money spent by the public sector or the government is money that can't be spent by the private sector. We know the government is not great at, at allocating resources. So, yes, we could get a huge splurge of spending on infrastructure projects or so-called job creation, but that will be diverting resources, I think, better employed in the in the private sector. So, so in the short term, yes, I'm, I'm sort of sanguine about these, these horrible deficit and borrowing numbers, but that's only because I think they are going to be short term, that you know, the government needs to, to get control of the, the finances again over the next few years. 
Um, provided it does that, though, I think there's no need for um, austerity mark two, whether that's austerity in the form of public spending cuts or austerity in the form of tax increases, which, of course, are austerity by a different name. Uh, I think the government can afford to, to sit tight there. Um, but it does very much assume that you know the economy does get rebooted and that we don't need to continue borrowing as much as we are now. So Julian spoke there about uh, the way that the private sector is much better allocated resources than the public sector. But of course, governments can put pressure on the private sector to uh, the way they allocate their resources. So Len, if we turn to an example of that, critics of the free market often talk about the minimum wage as an example of um, saying that free marketeers are crying wolf because despite what we believe about price floors cause them oversupply, there are examples of this not, not happening. Perhaps this is the reason why George, George Osborne got a free pass when he introduced the national living wage in 2015. And now the government is committed to raising the national living wage to two thirds of median hourly earnings by 2024. Given that the government can put pressure or legislate um, to, uh, to uh, private sector behavior, do you think it should be scrapped? The minimum wage is uh, something which economists are not totally in love with. Uh, when you start messing around with prices for anything, you get all sorts of peculiar results happening. Now, minimum, minimum wages, as applied in the UK, have not led to massive unemployment, as some, uh, some people claimed when they were first introduced. But nevertheless, I think they've not been, they, they've, they, they have acted to slow recruitment in some areas of the economy. And certainly, if we look at the, the big increases which are, are being suggested, the, the, the plan at the moment uh, is to raise, as you say, is to raise the national living wage to 66% uh, or two thirds of median hourly earnings. And some groups want to push that further. The TUC, for example, has been arguing for uh, a much higher minimum wage, uh, which would be applied to all workers. Uh, the Resolution Foundation has also been arguing for higher uh, wages. Now, this may be something which in fair weather, uh, the economy could adjust to. But if you look at the situation we're in at the moment, anything which raises the cost of employing labor is going to be very, very difficult. And we know, we know from, from loads of evidence in Britain, the United States and elsewhere, that the groups which are most likely to be hit by minimum wage hikes are those precisely those disadvantaged groups in low paid jobs, young people in particular, uh, minority ethnic groups in particular, uh, who um, need to get into the labour market. And if they can't get into the labour market at the bottom, they're not going to make progress further up the ladder either. So I, I, I think we ought to be very careful uh, in, in assuming that raising minimum wages is an appropriate thing to do at the moment. Now, we know that, uh, we, do, we know that the minimum wage was a favourite of a previous Chancellor, George Osborne. Julian, I wonder what I could ask you with the a looming budget, uh, uh, you know, a budget possibly in July by the current chancellor. Do you think there's a there's a possibility of tensions opening up between Number Ten and the Treasury? Um, well, I, I think they are. We're in a funny position at the moment, where the the chancellor seems to be one of the most popular, if not the most popular, ministers during this crisis. But uh, that's basically, of course, because he's been spending enormous amounts of, of, of public money. Um, my fear is that this will become a habit. That number ten, in particular, will get used to the idea that you know the government doing loads of stuff is a, is a good thing, and the government therefore should do should do more. Um, I think the Treasury will start pushing back against that, and also quite rightly i think already the treasury is starting to downplay expectations of anything substantial as, as soon as july um, i think that's right i think if we can hold off on a budget that would be the right thing to do uh, partly because it doesn't make a lot of sense to be stimulating demand when large parts of the economy will still be in lockdown but also because i think if we wait until the autumn it will become clearer that a massive fiscal stimulus isn't needed anyway because the recovery will be uh, underway simply because the lockdown is being lifted. Um, I also think it, it, it's wrong to focus too much on stimulating demand. I don't think demand is really going to be the problem. Um, ironically, lots of people have actually built up quite substantial savings during this crisis, so there's, there's plenty of money there to spend if they want to. Um, I think the bigger problems are on the, the supply side, you know, partly the fact that so much of the economy is shut down, so people can't you know, simply cannot sell the goods and services they normally would do. Um, but what the government needs to do, therefore, is focus on, on improving what's happening on the supply side. And there are some encouraging signs here. I mean, there's talk, for example, at last of a fundamental reform of, of planning laws to make it easier to build houses and you know, liberalise the, 
the high street so that people can shift properties from one use to another. That's very encouraging. There are some other smaller things that might be done, like um, liberalizing sundry trading laws. Um, normally, that probably doesn't make a lot of difference. But you know, in the current circumstances, if we increase the, the capacity of, of shops, that's a really big deal because of the social distancing rules. So there's so lots of things the government can do on the supply side. Uh, in terms of spending more money, there, there might be a case for a bit more infrastructure spending. But I think only if those are projects that make sense in their own right. Uh, rather than as job creation schemes. Uh, there might be a case of some targeted spending, particularly on capacity in schools and hospitals to, uh, to help schools in particular to, to reopen. And maybe a, a little bit of more money on the skills training, but I think basically that should be led by the private sector. So, so, so overall, I think the government's ambition should be to reduce intervention by you know, liberalising the supply side rather than doing even more on the demand side, when actually that's probably not the problem. Well, I'm just going to start turning to some of the questions coming on YouTube, if I can encourage viewers to uh, submit their questions to YouTube. I've got a question here from uh, Jamie Legg. Does Julian and Len, or do Julian and Len believe that restructuring the current social care model with an ageing population is now on the cards? What with the huge government debt that lays in front of us? Uh, Len, why don't I turn to you first? Well, social care is something which governments have... have uh, shied away from doing anything about for quite a long time. We saw we saw an attempt by Mrs May to do something about it, which the, the voters didn't like, and, and so this hot potato was dropped. Clearly, we have to do something about this. I think we need some kind of social insurance system to do it. I think people, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about generational uh, imbalances and so on. And I, I, well, I think these are exaggerated. There is a sense in which. Uh, you know, if, if we say it's out of the general taxpayer to pay for social care, then we are going to be saying that this is younger people, uh, you know, uh, subsidising uh, boomers uh, yet again. And so I think we need we need to find some way of, you know, we, we could, for example, uh, you know, I, I work beyond 65. I don't pay national insurance. It's not clear to me why I don't pay national insurance. Uh, you know, I'm still working. I'm paying income tax. Um, these are things which we ought to explore, uh, finding ways in which older people can uh, put some money into the pot. Uh, it's, it's not an issue which is easy to think about, but there are a number of ideas knocking around. And I think certainly this is something which the government ought to get to grips with. Um, Julian and then, we, we, you know, we are, the IEA is a classical liberal think tank, um, and, the, and if we look at the government action, you know, we have a natural scepticism of government intervention. And in, in, on one hand, if you look at the response to the crisis, we're seeing big government on one hand. But on the other hand, we're seeing um, all sorts of liberalisation, um, you know, restaurants being allowed to offer uh, takeaways. I mean, you know, for example, who knew that they actually had to uh, have a separate law for that? You know, what's your response in terms of uh, your fears of big government as opposed to some of the liberalisation we're seeing? Hmm. Well, I'll, I'll comment on that first. I think that even from a sort of classical liberal point of view, what the, the government first did is, is entirely appropriate. So in a sense, coronavirus is a, is a classic example of a, of a huge externality, you know, a classic example of where there's a public health problem where if the, if the government step doesn't step in, then the market would sort of under provide in, in, in some sense. It wouldn't properly protect people from, from coronavirus. So there's clearly a case for the, the government to, to step in. I think even the, the fiercest critic of the of the nanny state uh, wouldn't have a have a problem with that. Um, but equally, it's very encouraging from a liberal point of view how how much of what the government has done is actually based on on deregulation rather than regulation. Um, I mean, some of these things may not last long. If, for example, lengthening the amount of time that uh, a, a delivery driver can work, you know, it may not be something that is sustainable. But um, the idea that it's it's easier for you know restaurants to provide takeaways, I think, is something that we would encourage or allowing pubs to open, have open air spaces. And that's all sort of liberalization that I think is, is quite welcome. Uh, it's interesting for me also that a lot of people on the left say, look what's happened in this crisis. The state has had to do so much more. Shouldn't we continue with that? But equally, people who are more sort of liberal or the you know, free market perspective can point to all the things the state has done in the opposite direction and say, well, actually, the state has demonstrated, this is, crisis has demonstrated the need for the government to do less in, in certain areas. So um, I don't think this is a huge challenge from a classical liberal point of view. It's a, it's a good example of where the state probably did have to step in, but in many ways has actually justified the state doing less 
during this crisis than it had done before. What about you, Len? How do you see that sort of fit, that, that sort of, you know, uh, sort of cheering on deregulation, but also concerns about big government? Uh, I, I obviously welcome the, the, the baby steps which have been taken in, in, in terms of deregulation, but wow, what a heck of a lot of stuff there is to do. The state is massively overstretched. It does things which it can't do competently and uh, uh, makes a mess of things which it has a long-standing responsibility for. I mean, what's happening to education at the moment is absolutely scandalous. That we can't that we can't repurpose buildings. We can't uh, think about bringing people in on Saturdays, having sh different shifts for kids and so forth. The idea that we 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 have to drift on into when October, November, whatever before uh, kids get uh, a decent uh, you know de decent schooling is is just ridiculous. I mean, uh, Julie and I, both parents, uh, we know that having kids around is lovely. But they, you know, you they're, 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 no, they're in the next room. But um, they, they, um, you know, they really do need to get back to school. Homeschool is a wonderful cartoon in the Telegraph today. I don't know if you saw it with four panels of, uh, you know, starting off in April, everybody was very optimistic about it. By, by September, everybody's tearing their hair out and wrecking their house because they can't, uh, you know, they're, they're just desperate to get back to school. Um, so what I'm saying here is that the, the government needs to focus much more on the things which governments can do and stop messing around with so many other things. I mean, another area which, uh, which is in a uh, crisis at the moment, we talk about social care a moment ago, child care is another one, because the government has intervened. Uh, we're going to have a, uh, a session on this actually in a future, uh, a future one of these things, um, talking about child care. Um, at the moment, we see all the problems which government has created in, in effect, uh, that we don't have enough places because uh, government has, has, has intervened to set you know, a, 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 a fixed price on the amount of money which it gives to the sector, which means that a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, child care practices can't, uh, you know, can't, um, can't run profitably. Um, and so we've got a shortage of places when the idea was to actually increase child care. It's actually paradoxically reducing child care. And we've got plenty of examples of this kind of thing. So the government needs to focus very much more. And it is something which uh, you'd expect a conservative government would do. But instead, it's just kind of lashing around blindly, uh, hoping that things will work out and, and making promises which are going to be very difficult to deliver on. Ashley, could I just <laughs> come in on... One point there. I mean, we, we talked earlier about the example of West Germany after after the war. Another German example more recently is how well the German healthcare system has, has dealt with the challenge from coronavirus. And uh, there are all sorts of differences, of course, between the UK and, and Germany. But one thing that stands out is that their healthcare system is is much more market led, um, you know, based on social or private insurance as well. And they, that's been much, much more flexible. I mean, it's so much easier to, to get, you know, to get tested in, in Germany than it has been here. Uh, you contrast that with the responses of the of the NHS and, and Public Health England in particular. That's in no way a criticism, of course, the, the, the doctors or the nurses or the, the frontline staff working uh, in the NHS in particular. But, you know, the, the, the leadership there has, has not been great. And that is a good example, I think, of a, of a failure of, of, of state planning, whereas something you know, more market led like Germany has been much, much more responsive and, and, and more effective in dealing with this crisis. Okay, well, let's turn to some more of the questions on YouTube. I've got Glyn Brailsford who asks, um, you know, you clearly, both of you have suggested steps to reboot the British economy. But uh, one is, what are the prospects of your uh, proposals being adopted? And is there a danger that the government has developed a taste for central planning? Over to you, Len. <laughs> well, there, there are a lot of people in the cabinet who we know are, are sympathetic to, to market ideas. Um, the, the thing is having uh, the, 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 the gumption to push these things through and to, to uh, really think carefully uh, about what you're doing. Rather, I mean, last week, um, Boris Johnson, who I've got a great deal of time for, suddenly says, oh, well, we, I'm going to guarantee apprenticeships. Well, how does he do that exactly? We know that we've, we've had many, many attempts to, to um, boost apprenticeships in the past. David Cameron was very keen on it, for example. Uh, the, 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 the latest wheeze was the apprentice, uh, apprenticeship levy, which um, every, every employer uh, with, with a, a more than £3 million uh, wage bill has to pay into this levy. And the result of this 
uh, instead of actually increasing the number of apprenticeships, the number of apprenticeships has dropped. And so that work, that way didn't work. You could go back to an older system where you actually subsidized employers to, to take people on. But we know what happened with that. It meant that essentially employers took the money, uh, shoved the, 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 these poor individuals on, onto the FE sector, where they were given uh, essentially very low level qualifications. This wasn't the German dual system with these high level apprenticeships. It was just Morrison shelf stackers being given an apprenticeship in, in, in shelf stacking. And that, I'm afraid, is what will happen with, with this apprenticeship scheme. So what I, I would like to see is people in the cabinet who know, you know, they've, 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 uh, they've been amongst the IA. They know, they, they know the, 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 the problems with these types of schemes. Don't just fall for them yet again when the civil servants come up with, a, you know, here's a ready-made one. You know, here's one I prepared earlier. Sign up to this one, Minister. No, don't do that. Think it through. And, and let's, see, uh, let's see a really... Uh, determined attempt to make markets work rather than to subvert them all the time. Yeah, I would uh, I would echo that, particularly in the context of the of the labour market. And obviously, Lenny is the expert on this, but it, it's worth stressing that we went into this crisis with relatively low levels of unemployment, high levels of employment. I think, if I remember right, we had pretty much the lowest unemployment rate in Europe, with the exception of Germany and the and the Netherlands, which are two countries that are sort of fairly small state fairly flexible labour markets. Um, and I think the government should remember that. So when it talks about government creating jobs, well, the government didn't have to create jobs before this crisis. Why do we assume it has to create them after them? I mean, the reason why unemployment is going up is because large parts of the economy have been shut down by the government. So it should be sufficient for the government to, to get out of the way. Uh, I think if it does that, we might be pleasantly surprised at how quickly unemployment falls. But if it moves in the other direction and, and simply adds to the burden of, of businesses, you know, adds to the labour costs, adds to regulation, um, then, of course, they're going to be slow to start rehiring people. Um, and in that sense, the government, rather than creating jobs, have actually continued to destroy them in a way that would be extremely unhelpful. Well, we've got a few minutes left. I wonder whether I could uh, urge our uh, YouTube viewers on our YouTube channel, IA London, uh, to hit subscribe, but also if they want to ask a question uh, before we uh, end the show. Len, I wonder whether also I could focus on one of the things that you talked about there was apprenticeships. Um, you spoke about the, the apprenticeships, and there's been a lot of focus and a lot of talk about you know, who will be hit the hardest. It'll be the young, it'll be low earners, it uh, may, well, may well be women. But in your report, you also talk about older workers and how little attention has been paid to older workers. Do you want to uh, talk about, a bit about that now? Yes, speaking as an older worker myself, I, I have an interest. I wasn't picking on you, don't worry. <laughs> I have an interest in this area. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's not widely understood how many uh, older people are still in work. 1.3 million over the age of 65, uh, nearly half a million over the age of 70 are still working. And there's been a, a sort of tendency in a lot of these discussions to say, oh, well, let's keep the, these old people locked up again and let the economy get moving. I think that would be really rather foolish. Where people are fit and able to work, they should be working. And we really want to encourage people. We know, we know that the, the, you know, the, the demographics of the UK population is that the proportion over the age of 65, over the age of 70, is going to be rising and rising and rising. And we want to encourage people to stay in work uh, if they want to do so. Uh, as long as they can, because they are net contributors then to the economy, rather than simply being uh, people who have to be propped up by the by, by the next generation of taxpayers. So, uh, you know, I think we should be very careful in assuming that that everybody over the age of 65 should stay at home uh, and and uh, and not be involved in the economy. Okay, I'm just another question, another question as has been asked about. Yeah, you know, we're, we're talking about the, the increase in uh, spending, public spending at the moment, but actually isn't this just a continuation of a trend that the percentage of private to public sector spending, um, uh, sorry, uh, public sector to private sector spending has been ratcheting up over the last hundred years? Well, there's certainly a problem there. It's, it, it's very easy to increase public spending. It's rather harder to, to cut it. So, yes, you too tend to get a ratchet effect that you know, the, the state always gets bigger. It never seems to, seems to get smaller. Um, I would be a bit more hopeful this time around. If, if you look at the increase in public borrowing, um, let's call it another £300 billion, to, to keep it simple. 
Um, roughly half of that is likely to be the direct cost of, of government measures. So that's things like the job retention scheme and the, the equivalent for the self-employed. Uh, now, those schemes should no longer be necessary. Indeed, we already know that the coronavirus job retention scheme is being wound down in October, which I think is a good thing. So, uh, so that part of the, the borrowing should automatically drop away. Uh, the other half is the indirect effect of the economic slowdown. So that's the fact that tax revenues are lower than they otherwise have been, and there'll be increases in welfare payments for things like universal credit and so on. So um, that part also should fall away as the economy recovers. So tax revenues rebound and welfare payments can fall back again. So, so hopefully this is the exception where the increase in, in public spending and borrowing is only temporary. Um, but it does still require government will not to make some of these things permanent. So there's a lot of pressure from you know, the big state think tanks as well as you know, big business that obviously likes these subsidies and the trade unions, as mentioned earlier. But lots of people lobbying for, for more spending. Uh, and in the short term, at least, of course, it, it does seem very popular. You know, people have, have seen the government step in and think, well, actually, we'd, we'd like this for the, for the longer term. But I think that all sorts of risks. So even if this were easily financeable forever and a day, you still have to ask about the impact on the economy in terms of the distortions that all this public spending brings, uh, whether the state is actually any better at allocating resources in the private sector. Clearly, I think not. Um, but also, at some point, people are going to start worrying about their future tax bills. So they might be reluctant to spend, not only because they're worried about maybe their health during the crisis or worried about losing their jobs, but also worried that at some point, there's going to be a reckoning for this in terms of higher taxes. So um, I think the government does have to be really careful. And, and I hope the government would be bold. And, and in this case, being bold actually means doing less rather than more. And for a government, of course, that's often a very hard thing to do because governments like to be seen to be doing stuff, um, particularly with sort of question marks about they've handled, how they've handled the health aspects of the, of the coronavirus crisis. Like, I do hope they don't see spending even more money as a way to continue or to start risk drawing some piece of say to, to step aside as soon as possible let markets work as normal but as we head into extra time here we've got matt carter on youtube who's come in with a uh, quite a, a, a score of gold come in with a question uh, what do len and julian make of the pace of the wind down of the furlough scheme are we wasting taxpayers money on jobs that would unlikely be viable in a few months time what do you think then well i've argued that for a while but uh you know, many of the jobs which are being furloughed at the moment aren't going to come back. And, and you know, we, we need to realise this as quickly as possible to allow firms to repurpose themselves, to start in new directions for people who are not going to be keeping on a, a job in this particular area to, to look for other things and so on. At the moment, we're living in a, you know, this very strange situation where, where people are quite happy in, in many cases. So I, I, in, a, in a sense, I'm quite happy staying at home. I say, saved a lot of money staying at home, you know, the amount of travel and, and meals out and things like this. Uh, so people are actually in a, a reasonable financial situation at the moment, but it, can't, it, it just can't go on. I mean, this is a very artificial setup. And the sooner realism breaks in, the quicker we can adjust, I think. And, uh, you know, the OECD today have come out with these projections, which don't show the UK in a very favourable light, because they're, they're saying that we'll take much longer to get out because we were in services and, uh, uh, rather than manufacturing. Uh, well, that, you know, that is, is a very simplistic way of looking at it. If we get a move on, if we get our skates on and actually start, uh, you know, start the market working rather than sort of carrying on in this rather dreamlike existence at the moment, then the quicker we will get back to some kind of uh, rapid rate of economic growth, which is what we what we all need. I, well, I, I obviously agree with that. I'll just add that the, the timetable for winding down the job retention scheme is, is, is consistent with what hopefully will happen to the to the lockdown. So we already know that you know this month non-essential retail will be allowed to, to reopen and zoos and other uh, other amusements as well. Um, I suspect that you know no later than, than August we'll start to see the the opening up of, of, of pubs and, and restaurants, perhaps on a limited basis to begin with, but the direction of travel will be clear. So by the time the scheme is wound down in, in October, I think you know a lot of these sectors will be reopened again. And, and frankly, if there are companies that can't operate in that new environment, then I'm afraid, as Len says, the best thing to do is to let them fail and allow the people that are sort of tied up with them to, to go and look for 
jobs elsewhere and those parts of the economy that, that, that can thrive. Um, I also am concerned about the impact on, on incentives. Um, I mean, initially it was right effectively to, to pay people to, to stay at home to protect the lives of others, but um, that's no longer the, the absolute priority that it was. When we, you know, we need to encourage people to, to get back to work or to, to move to other jobs if their existing job is disappearing or to set up their own businesses or whatever. Um, I think there could be a potential upside here, which is that um, we could actually reboot productivity in the same, same way. I mean, a lot of the, the companies that are now in trouble are frankly companies that have been close to the edge for a long time anyway. Uh, if we could um, you know, push them over the edge, that may be no bad thing to, to get people to redeploy to areas where they will be more productive. Uh, to get rid of the so-called zombie businesses. I hate that term, but I think it's sort of an appropriate one. Um, and this could be a, a, a small silver lining in all of this, that we actually start to tackle some of the productivity problems we've got as well. But that does require the government to, to step aside and not, you know, not pay to close to 10 million people to, to stay at home and do nothing. You know, rather, we need to, to get those people working again. So just before we wrap up, I wonder whether I could turn to both of you. So, you know, assume that social distancing rules have been relaxed. Uh, you walk into a building, you step into the elevator, and there's Boris Johnson, and you've got a, you've got your one minute elevator pitch uh, to, to sell the ideas that you've written about in your report. Len, what's your elevator pitch? I, I think I'd, I'd, I'd tell Boris that he 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 did the best job he probably could initially uh, in relation to the uh, to, to the lockdown, but he has to uh, recognise that things have moved on, uh, that we've got to get very very quickly back to something approaching normality. And the, the way to do this is to let the market work rather than to try to dream up new wheezes uh, for the government to step in and do this and do that. So, OK, Julie, what about your elevator pitch? OK, well, two points. We first of all, continue to, to ease the, the lockdown. I think that'll go a long way towards um, restoring, rebooting the economy. But, but the second point also is about confidence. Um, there is a danger that even if the lockdown is lifted, people are still nervous about uh, the health aspects, about um, employment, about future taxes. So, so it's very important that there's much clearer messaging from the government than I think there is now. At the moment, we seem to be taking some two steps forward and one, maybe one and a half back. So on the one hand, non-essential retail is opening. On the other hand, we're rolling back on plans to open up schools. We have uh, face marks on public transport. We have this sort of ridiculous 14-day quarantine for people coming here, even from countries that have completely got on top of coronavirus. So those sort of mixed messages aren't, aren't helping. I think there needs to be a, sort of a clearer and consistent path towards easing the, easing the lockdown so that not only do you get the lifting of the health measures themselves, but also you get more public confidence that things are indeed moving in the right direction, as is fully justified by the health data. If you look at you know, the trends in pretty much every health indicator, they're clearly heading in the right direction. Well, Len and Julian, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, for viewers on YouTube, uh, we've put the links to their, uh, their, to their report and their articles uh, in the chat function, so please do follow that. Can I also thank you for watching us this evening? Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel, IA London. Uh, listen to our podcast on Podbean and tune into our next definite articles on Monday, the 21st of June. Thank you very much for joining us. Good night.